Good afternoon and welcome to the Hudson Institute Online. I'm Blaise Nishtal, a fellow here at Hudson, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to our conversation about connecting development with diplomacy with Dame Karen Pierce, the British ambassador to the United States. For the past several months, the world has been in the grips of the COVID-19 pandemic. I've had the opportunity to host conversations with leading development officials from the United States and around the world. This strikes me as an important time to be talking about development assistance because of the impact on developing nations of the pandemic can be easily overlooked when we have such major health and economic crises to grapple with at home. If you've not seen past events, including with USA uh, Deputy Administrator Bonnie Glick, the State Department's Jim Richardson, and Ambassador Shinichi Shida from the Japanese uh, Bureau for International Cooperation, you can check them out on Hudson.org. In those events, we discussed how the U.S. and its allies are helping developing countries prepare for and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also more broadly about why development assistance matters, what it can accomplish, and how it might need to be updated uh, in light of what we're learning about both how to make aid more impactful and effective, uh, but also how other international actors like China are approaching foreign aid. Such a rethinking of development assistance uh, has just occurred in the U.K., Last month, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the merger of the Department for International Development, DFID, with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office into a single entity that would be responsible for both development and diplomacy. To explain the reasoning behind this merger, its significance, and the impact it will have, I'm honored to be joined today by Dame Karen Pierce. Dame Karen uh, has had a remarkable career uh, well before coming to, to Washington as ambassador. Uh, I'll just give some highlights. Uh, because it is so storied. Uh, and those include serving as the United Kingdom's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York uh, and the Director General for Political Affairs and Chief Operating Officer of the Foreign and Commonwealth in London. Dame Karen, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you. Uh, let me turn it over to you for some opening remarks. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Blaise. Thank you very much to Hudson Institute for inviting me and, and for picking this interesting uh, topic. Um, as you said, uh, development and diplomacy, they're very much part of our overseas policy uh, and have been for many years. And when I was ambassador in Afghanistan, uh, I had a very large development section uh, and we worked together to try and integrate an economic perspective uh, into the work we were doing uh, alongside the Afghan government. Uh, so I've seen for myself how important it is uh, to look at economic development alongside political uh, development. Uh, the Department for International Development is, is only 23 years old. Uh, our foreign office is about 200 uh, years old, and um, it's what's known as a great uh, Department of State uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, but what we're going to do is merge the two departments. Uh, it's not a takeover, it's very much a merger uh, and create a new department called the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, and the reasons for doing that are, are several fold, uh, but one goes back to what I was saying about economic development. Uh, it's very important uh, as the world gets more and more complicated, uh, as we have globalization, as you have uh, many more uh, new emerging markets uh, coming onto the scene, uh, that diplomats and foreign policymakers uh, really understand about economics and really understand where economic development fits in uh, to our own uh, overseas policies and the way we interact with, with other countries and the big international organizations. Um, so that was one reason uh, for the merger. Uh, the other reason, as Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, said in the House of Commons, um, we really wanted to make sure that we had as coherent a foreign policy as, as possible. Uh, and that I don't, that's not just classic uh, diplomacy, say in the security sphere, it's the whole range of overseas policy, uh, including trade policy. And you can see easily that if you have an ambassador uh, going into country X uh, and trying to encourage, let's say, human rights reforms, governance reforms, um, it's helpful if all British assistance to that particular country is working together in support of that objective. And sometimes we have found uh, that our bilateral objectives break down a little bit differently 
uh, in countries. And you know, with the best will in the world, that that's confusing uh, for the recipient. Um, and then I think the third reason is because we think it will make us much better equipped to deal with the big challenges uh, that are coming. COVID-19 itself, you referred to that, uh, that's thrown up uh, the critical importance of being able to look at these overseas issues uh, in the round. So our Department for International Development, they always would have had a role in the development of vaccines, but that needs putting alongside the interaction with other countries, uh, alongside international diplomacy, uh, to make sure that the health regulations uh, are upheld, to make sure that countries participate in these efforts, uh, and to make sure that the vaccines, when developed, uh, get where they're needed. Uh, so we believe that by re-merging the departments, uh, we as Britain uh, will be a more powerful uh, overseas actor uh, on the international stage, will be able to direct the money, uh, not just to the classic function, of relieving poverty around the world, but we will be able better to target it so it reinforces uh, foreign policy, overseas policy objectives. So thank you for, for providing that context and, and I look forward to, to drilling down into uh, some of these questions, especially around the challenges that you think are coming up that this alignment of diplomacy and development might help the UK uh, address. But I thought maybe we could first take a step back Mm -hmm. um, and, and I could ask about how the UK assesses the value of, of development or why it values development in the first place. Um, the UK is such a generous donor. I think it's the third largest uh, provider of uh, official development assistance uh, in the world. Uh, but if you look at it uh, by GDP, uh, it, it actually provides a greater share of its GDP in foreign assistance than the top two, uh, the US and Germany, um, which is, is quite remarkable. And I, I was wondering, what is it about foreign assistance that uh, that sort of helps the UK achieve its its, its interests and promote its values? Uh, well, thank you for those uh, kind words. We spend 0.7 percent uh, of our GDP on what's called official uh, development assistance, and that means it corresponds uh, to the OECD's rules on how to spend uh, such such money. Uh, we've always, I think, been very strong aid donors, assistance donors, uh, and I think that probably, uh, to be honest, goes back to a much older legacy of the Commonwealth, the Empire, being involved in countries in very detailed ways. And um, I don't have the history at my fingertips, but I think as countries became more and more independent, uh, we as Britain worked with those countries to assist their governmental and economic development. And so our development assistance programs have always uh, had very strong links uh, in terms of what's happening on the ground, in terms of countries coming out of uh, independence and starting uh, to take their place on the world stage. Uh, and then we've had some very committed uh, politicians uh, from both parties uh, who've really wanted uh, to give a boost to development, who have really had the philosophy uh, that economic development is the key to helping countries climb out of poverty. Uh, and I think you can see in what China's done, what India has done, uh, they themselves uh, have lifted hundreds of millions of people uh, out of poverty uh, through economic development, independently of the help they may have received uh, from the UN and, and UN agencies. Uh, but a large part of, of British aid uh, does go, the money does go uh, to the UN and agencies and regional development banks because we think they are good multipliers of what can be achieved on the ground. Um, I think we are the only G7 country to spend 0.7%. Uh, that's the UN target. Uh, we also spend 2% uh, on defence spending and I think we're uh, the only NATO country to do both as uh, both the development uh, and the security. Uh, but as I was hoping to explain in the opening, uh, we see those two things uh, as inextricably intertwined if you're trying to have a real effect on the ground. And I think that certainly speaks to uh, the, the importance of what we in, in the US here call the three Ds, defense, diplomacy, and, and development. Absolutely. 
And in fact, I think uh, Prime Minister Johnson, when he was announcing the merger, referred to uh, a reality that he said that the current COVID-19 reality shows that distinctions between diplomacy and overseas development are artificial and outdated. Uh, and I was wondering, is it something specific about COVID-19 that led to this real realization, or is it more of a, um, a, a broader reality that, uh, that the UK has been thinking about for a while that, that led to this understanding of the need to align, better align and coordinate diplomacy and development? Uh, it is something we've been thinking about uh, for a very long time. And as you may know, it's not universally uh, accepted in the United Kingdom or in Parliament uh, that the two uh, departments sh should be merged in this way. Um, but the present government believes very strongly that they should uh, because of this coherence reason, uh, because you can't actually have an effect uh, on the ground in the developing country uh, unless you take account uh, of the economic issues and economic development, uh, but also say so that if we are, uh, as the British government, seeking to pull levers, e.g. on human rights, uh, for example, on good governance, uh, that if you like the whole, um, all of our tools <laughs> uh, can be put in service uh, of, of that goal. And I stress again, we stick to the OECD uh, rules about how uh, such assistance gets dispersed. Um, but I think we all, so the, the merger was uh, in the minds of, of the government uh, for quite a while. Uh, but I think we all know that COVID has brought an unprecedented set of challenges uh, and very neatly illustrates why we all need to be as joined up as possible. And since um, the pandemic began, the government has committed uh, around $1 billion uh, to dealing just with the challenges coming out of COVID, uh, and they include helping developing countries uh, build up their health infrastructure, uh, helping them to become much more resilient, uh, as well as all the vaccines work uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I think that actually is now going to be uh, a very good model uh, for, for working. How do we um, use the development lens to pull together the strands of a bigger response, political, uh, health security, uh, health development, uh, in the hope that we will avoid uh, future pandemics in future, but make ourselves uh, and those countries whom we give assistance to uh, much more able to cope with and resist the effects of uh, another pandemic. I think that's a, a really important point. I know that's something that here in the US, the development community often struggles with is uh, both prioritization and, and coordination in country between those different priorities that might be happening at the diplomatic level versus the security relationship versus the, the development goals. And so uh, I, I think having those united, there's a, there's a strong case to be made for the ability to have a more coherent policy uh, but since you mentioned the, the criticism, some of the criticisms that, that I've seen uh, put forward are, are a fear from the development community in the United Kingdom um, that by uniting the sort of the, the diplomacy with the development, the political uh, with the development, uh, the, the purposes for which aid is given might change and it might no longer be a purely humanitarian or altruistic tool, um, but it might, decisions on where and when to give aid might be tinged by uh, by, by other forms of decision making. Uh, and I think, in fact, um, in his speech announcing the merger, Prime Minister Johnson suggested, you know, maybe we need to make decisions like giving more aid to Ukraine, which has a more of a, a, a geopolitical and security impact for the UK versus a place like Zimbabwe. Um, is this a change in the model of where and why the UK will be, will be giving aid? Um, I think at its core, uh, the model remains the same. We, we want to assist economic development. We want to assist good government, including human rights. Uh, we want to relieve poverty. Uh, so I think the core mission uh, doesn't change. Uh, but the way it gets delivered m might well change, as, as the Prime Minister uh, set out. Um, you know, I have seen cases where sometimes the aid is going to... Um, what you might think of as a, 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 a high value project or a very worthwhile uh, project, but it's not contributing uh, to the overall forward trajectory 
uh, of a particular country. Uh, and I think you sometimes see that where human rights are, are, are involved. Uh, or you have countries who perhaps, while uh, meeting the poverty threshold, uh, are actually engaged in wars against their neighbours uh, or persecution of some of their communities. Uh, in the government's view, it does not make sense for our aid not to reflect those realities and be used in a way uh, that encourages uh, greater progress across the board. Um, now, I know that some development specialists uh, are against this, as you said. Uh, they don't like the notion of conditionality, uh, particularly political uh, conditionality being applied. Um, but I think one can make a very respectable argument that if you don't apply some political conditionality, uh, the country itself never actually uh, gets on a serious forward trajectory. Um, so if you're, if for the sake of argument, a donor is turning a blind eye uh, to human rights abuses and violations without resolving those very uh, violations, a country is not going uh, to be able to put itself on a good governance and economic development track. Uh, so I think that's one plank of it. And as, as the Prime Minister said, the, the government wants to be very clear that we are helping countries uh, who share our view of um, what good government looks like um, and who are our close, closest allies and partners in their particular regions. It's not about uh, favouring one region uh, over another. Uh, but it might be about, you know, it's, it's early days yet, it might be about if you have two equally uh, deserving cases from a poverty point of view, uh, one country might be a very good example to their neighbours on human rights. And that might be something uh, we want to encourage. Well, I think it's an excellent point that you make, Dame Karen, about human rights abuses or misgovernance and conditionality, because in some cases you could see the lack of conditionality as also a, actually a, a form of conditionality. And, and here I'm specifically thinking of um, the way that the Chinese, for example, invest in countries and provide assistance uh, with sort of no strings attached compared to the way that, that Western donors might give aid. Uh, but, but it actually does come with expectations then of sort of obedience or, or influence and sway uh, that they think they can buy through those investments. So I think even in places where we think that there might be no strings attached or no conditions imposed, it actually comes with other expectations. Um, which, which leads me to ask one of the, the, the reasons that you laid out for the merger is sort of pivoting to face uh, new global challenges, one of which is obviously the, the COVID pandemic and uh, sort of health insecurity that we're now seeing. Um, but what are the other challenges that the, that the UK sees ahead of it and, and how does the development uh, issue fit into those? Um, I think what I might just do, Blaise, if I may, is just make clear that where it's humanitarian aid, yeah. uh, we, we continue uh, uh, to give yes. that as a separate, uh, a se not, not a separate enterprise, uh, but it's a separate strand uh, within our development uh, assistance. So uh, that will continue. And also that we will um, not do things that are a moral hazard. We will not ask a country um, to put its own systems, finances, people at risk uh, in order to do something that we are advocating and that we're using aid for. So in that respect, absolutely, we're very different uh, from the Chinese. And I think in the vast majority of, of countries, uh, they're not going to see a big difference in the way uh, we operate. Uh, what I hope they will see is that we are much better joined up in terms of our overall uh, bilateral and multilateral objectives uh, as it affects that, that particular country. Uh, in terms of the, the challenges, um, I do worry about the human rights side, to, to be absolutely honest. I think. Um, 10, 15 years ago, there would have been an understanding, tacit and in some places reluctant, say, uh, about what sort of human rights, good government development uh, countries needed to do uh, to put themselves on that um, upwards uh, trajectory. 
and they principally center, not exclusively, but principally uh, center around equality of access, equality of access to the law, equality of access to services. Uh, and that's true whether you're talking about a gender divide, uh, an LGBT divide, an ethnic divide, uh, or, or, or whatever. Um, and yet in recent years, more recent years, we found it harder and harder uh, to pass resolutions supporting that uh, at the United Nations and Human Rights Council as, uh, and elsewhere. And to a certain extent, one could say uh, that countries are less impressed uh, with the Western values that used to define universally uh, these, these trajectories. And again, it's not about wanting to impose things uh, on countries, but it is about trying to help uh, this upward uh, trajectory uh, and a sustainable upward trajectory, which is where I think your China point comes in. And um, I do worry that we don't talk enough <laughs> about these values issues and we don't um, like to get into the uh, evidence that exists that if you are good on human rights, that reinforces your ability to develop your economy. Uh, and I think that's worth the deeper conversation uh, and I think it also tracks uh, with the rule of law. Uh, so it's not just about values, important as they are, there's a very material link uh, between rule of law and foreign direct investment, say attractiveness to foreign direct investment and there's a very real link between upholding uh, international human rights commitments uh, and economic development. Absolutely, and I think there's a, a growing consensus, at least here in the in, in the American development community, um, that at the heart of a lot of these interlinked problems that you mentioned, both poverty, but conflicts, human rights abuses, um, is state fragility, which is fundamentally linked to the, the lack, of, lack of trust and lack of legitimacy that governments have when they are uh, either oppressive uh, or coercive. Um, or, or just capricious in how they govern um, and, and people that live under their rule don't trust them or can don't know what to expect from them and that inhibits all sorts of the positive behaviors and developments that, that would put a country on, on, on a better trajectory. Um, and, and having made that very strong case for, for the, the values of the rule of law and good governance, I wonder if um, there's a connection between this, this move on the development side and another uh, UK initiative that, that has come up recently, the D10, or this idea of uh, of a greater grouping of democratic countries. Um, and it, are these sort of linked as part of a broader, more value-based strategy for the UK, or, or how do they fit together? Um, again, if I may, I'll just finish off with the previous question. Sure. I should have said that it's not um, it's not just about equality of, of different sorts of groups. Uh, we all know that there is rising inequality in the world and I think I'm right in still saying that the vast number of the world's poorest people actually live in middle income countries. Um, so this, this economic inequality uh, is something that people like the World Bank uh, are looking at and, and we support uh, that work and that probably uh, will need to be one of the big challenges uh, that gets addressed. I'm just not not an expert uh, in it. Um, in terms of um, your last question, I'm so sorry. Could you repeat it? Sure. Well, the, the, D10, the D10 initiative D10. and whether yeah. that fits into sort of this, this more political values-based uh, conception of development that you were talking about as well. Um, I think it's early days, uh, and the D10 is fundamentally the G7 plus, uh, but who exactly is in the D10 depends a little bit on the issue uh, we're talking about, and, and I think that's fine, uh, but it is an attempt to try and bring together not just democracies uh, around the world, uh, but particularly uh, market-oriented economies. Uh, so it's the combination of the two uh, that means we think it's a very good way uh, of discussing new technological challenges, uh, for example, around 5G and what comes after 5G, uh, so that we're not left um, vulnerable to market failure and dependent, overly uh, dependent on, on Chinese companies. 
Um, but it, it is quite critical uh, that the countries involved should um, be interested in tech and be interested in, in market economies. That, that's what makes it different, I think, uh, from the G20, uh, which is purely an economic uh, organization. It's the, it's the combination again, and um, it fundamentally speaks to open trading systems, uh, open economies, transparent ways of doing business, uh, rule of law values, human rights values. Um, and a number of countries are interested uh, in talking about these issues uh, in a different sort of way. And um, we look forward to pursuing a whole manner uh, of discussions, whether it's um, stability in the Indo-Pacific region, or it's free trade, or it's um, tech issues uh, with, with these countries. So then on that point, perhaps I could just finish up by asking, obviously the US and the, and the UK uh, have a special relationship, a special partnership on, on a range of issues uh, on the military and intelligence side. Uh, but having talked about how uh, this merger uh, would enable better cooperation uh, within the, the British government, I wonder um, if there's thoughts on how the development cooperation might look across the Atlantic in the, in the, in the US uh, UK relationship going forward. Uh, well, we, we have a very good um, relationship. It's not possibly as um, interwoven as, say, defence uh, or intelligence might be, uh, but we both cooperate on the ground in countries. So when I was in Afghanistan, uh, the development section in the British Embassy uh, would work very closely on projects uh, with the development section attached to the American Embassy. Uh, and sometimes... Um, because of um, the Department for International Development's very strong reputation, uh, sometimes they will uh, execute programs uh, for the, the Americans funded by uh, American uh, USAID uh, uh, money. Uh, and then in capitals, uh, there are lots of exchanges about how best to uh, go about uh, development assistance, uh, how we can collaborate uh, in principle in, in other countries uh, and how best we can meet some of these really big uh, global challenges like COVID and where best to target uh, development assistance. Uh, we haven't yet though, I think, got to the um, really interwoven stage that we have with some of the other disciplines we, we deal with uh, within the special relationship. Uh, and I think the fact that we're now more joined up with overseas policy as a whole uh, will actually make it easier to have those um, integrated conversations uh, with Washington so that say if we're looking at resolving a conflict, uh, let's take Libya for, for example, um, it will be easier to have a conversation that talks not just about the conflict but what sort of economic assistance uh, might be needed uh, to piece the country's economy. Uh, back together. Uh, so I think from our perspective, we think this merger uh, is an exciting boost uh, to our efforts to do foreign policy overseas, because it will enable us not just to look at things uh, in the round from uh, perhaps an academic perspective, uh, but actually to go out and make those things a reality in a much more coherent and quicker fashion than we've been able to do before. Well, I know it's certainly true that uh, the United States is stronger when it works with, with partners and allies like the UK on all sorts of fronts. And uh, I know that in developing countries, it's also easier to, to make contributions to their development mm -hmm. when, uh, when donors are, are aligned and, and, and coordination and working uh, in, 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 in tangent or in conjunction with one another as opposed to at, uh, at sort of at odds with one another. So hopefully uh, this will be a solid contribution to that as well. Uh, Dame Karen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for telling us uh, about this latest development of the merger of development and diplomacy in the UK. Uh, it's been an honor to have you uh, at the Hudson Institute. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for having me. Really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Good day.